I have the answer to every Micro Four Thirds user's prayers. It is the Panasonic G9 Mark II, and it is incredible. It has phase detect autofocus, which everybody has been asking for, but it also has tricks that your little camera there doesn't have like crazy image stabilization for incredible low light performance, the ability to make 100 megapixel images by stacking them together. You can't do that, Jess. What did you even bring to this? I have the Canon R7, which I think is just a really good APS-C camera. And I don't know, I'm interested in seeing how these two stack up. So let's compare them. We're gonna do landscapes, wildlife, sports, portraits, and let's see if all this big game you're talking is actually real. But first, I wanna take a moment to thank our sponsor, Adorama. Whether you're looking for a new camera, lens, lighting, tripod, backpack, computer, they have everything that you could possibly need if you're a photographer. And they have great deals. They have a VIP program where you can accrue points when you buy stuff and then get free stuff later. So if you want a great deal on good gear and fast shipping, go to Adorama using the links down below. Thanks, Adorama. All right, we're gonna start by taking some pictures of this nice little bridge we have back here to see if your 33 megapixels can beat my 25 megapixels, but I got a trick up my sleeve. First, let's take a look at a standard 25 megapixel image versus a 100 megapixel stacked image. Right away, the 100 megapixel image just seems to have much more detail, it's much clearer. You can see all the individual saw marks on the wood, but it does look over sharpened to me, so I want to apply the same amount of sharpening to the 25 megapixel image, so it's more apples to apples. And zooming way in, indeed, I do see more detail in the 100 megapixel image. And also, look, the noise is cleaner, so it is sharper, more detailed, and cleaner. Definitely a better image. But how does it compare to the R7 picture? First, notice the two images have different aspect ratios. Micro Four Thirds is more square. And this means that you crop less in 8x10 formats like you use for Instagram. And I think it's generally a better format. So even with fewer megapixels, you get more out of those megapixels. Zooming in, the winner's clear. Me, 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 me. The Panasonic just shows so much more detail in its 100 megapixel mode than even 32 megapixels out of the R7 can, even with a much more expensive professional 15 to 35 L lens. Look at how much texture is visible even in the shadows that are just lost on Chelsea's camera. These have equivalent depth of field, but look how much detail there is in these pine needles. The Panasonic picture is just more real and lifelike. Let's talk about the handling and the design of these cameras because I thought Micro Four Thirds was supposed to be kind of small and lightweight, but your camera's looking the same size as mine. Well, it doesn't have to be small and light. It's nice to have a big grip because this is a professional camera. You know, they both have two card slots. Both these cameras have plenty of buttons and dials. They both have flip screens. So they're versatile for both stills and any sorts of hybrid video. You know where Micro Four Thirds does show its preference for being compact is in the lens selection. That's true, my lens is huge. I had to put a full frame lens on this because their APS-C lens selection is extremely limited. Yeah, you literally don't have a super wide angle lens for APS-C unless you were to get an adapter and then get a DSLR lens and put that on there. That so is true, you could adapt DSLR lenses to the mirrorless body. How's your selection of third party lenses, by the way? Wow, oh, sore spot there. It hurts, so Canon, is limiting third party lenses. That means like Sigma, Tamron, other brands are not allowed to make lenses for the mount. Micro Four Thirds is a totally open platform and it's been around for a long, long time. So there are just hundreds of different lenses. But I'm not gonna be able to save money by getting the third party lenses, but I do have access to like specialty lenses like the 85 F12 or the 50 millimeter F12. I am so, jealous of all that bokeh you can make. But the thing is I also have an upgrade path. So if I wanted to move to a full frame camera, I would have my lens selection to go with it. Okay, so you have more room for growth. You could definitely create results that I could not create with your full frame lenses. Sure. But most people don't want to be spending like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And I think if you can find the lenses you need in the Micro Four Thirds system, then you can be happy with it. And the new body is definitely like help you get more than ever out of these lenses. Maybe we should try some long exposures because this has another few tricks that I think are going to beat your fancy Canon. You got all these tricks up your sleeve. 
So we're in front of a waterfall at Devil Hopyard State Park and I brought my tripod and I brought my Maven filter so I could get a long exposure of the waterfall. That, that seems like a lot to carry. Us micro four thirds users, we like to travel light. You know why we're always on the go. We are fleet of foot. We hop from one step to the other to find the perfect composition. We can't be weighed down with a tripod, but we don't need it. You know why? Because the small micro four thirds sensor, it's light. That means that sensor stabilization is more effective than your big sensor could possibly be. And I bet I can handhold one second exposures and nail this waterfall without a tripod. Let's see it. Let's see it. First, I'm putting on my Maven six stop filter. My friend Michael the Maven makes these, they're amazing. And they click right on, they're magnetic. I've got three stops. That's probably not enough for what I'm doing. 10 stops. Oh, everything's color coded. That's really yeah. nice. I know, I love these. I appreciate easy. And then I've got my tripod set up and I have a long exposure. I'm setting it to five seconds and it should get nice feathery results. I have my little old fashioned filter here. I have to screw on. Ugh. And yeah, I think I actually just cross threaded it. Okay, I gotta get those Michael the Maven filters. So I'm gonna go to shutter priority, one second. I'm gonna try to stabilize my body as much as possible. And then I'm also gonna shoot continuously and I'm gonna take 10 shots. Before I press the shutter, I'm gonna take a deep breath and then slowly exhale throughout the entire course of shooting. That's a lot easier than carrying a tripod around. It also lets you be prepared for a spontaneous waterfall that spontaneously appears. Okay, let's see how our pictures turned out. Let's zoom in. Chelsea's picture's way sharper here, but let me start with the excuses. I'm at F22 on micro four thirds, which is like F44 equivalent. And that means that there's a lot of diffraction and that reduced sharpness. Also, she had Michael's nice filters, whereas I had some junky filter and the filter itself will definitely reduce sharpness. So I'm, I'm going to say this test doesn't count, but I do want to show you the power of being able to handhold one second shots. With a little post-processing, I can overcome any dynamic range concerns. I'll pick one exposure with the bright part exposed, and then all of the sharp one second exposures that I got. I'll select all the layers, edit, auto align layers. Now you can see how the different exposures overlap. I'll hide the underexposed image now, and, and I'm going to select all the layers involved in the exposure for the waterfall. I'll select layer, smart objects, and then convert to smart object. Now I'm going to blend them with layer, smart objects, stack mode, and maximum. Now I'll show the exposure for the brighter areas and add a mask to it, holding down the op key to block everything out. I'm going to paint white in the mask to unhide this part of the image, just the parts that are overexposed. And there you go, a nice smooth waterfall with multi-second exposure and an impossible amount of dynamic range, all done with a micro four thirds camera. For the stabilization test, I attached the 70 to 200 equivalent and used optical image stabilization combined with the sensor stabilization. And I was blown away by the Panasonic G92's ability to keep sharp shots up to five stops below the reciprocal rule. At that point, it kind of fell off. But this blew me away because my Sony's and Nikon's are only good for about three stops. But I was surprised by the Canon R7 here, which held on a full stop longer than the G9 II. Really impressive Canon, but both of them pretty amazing for handheld low light stuff. For the wildlife shoot, I have the Panasonic 100 to 400. That gives me an equivalent 200 to 800 millimeter zoom range. And I have the Canon 100 to 500, and that gives me an equivalent, I don't know. <laughs> you, go, you go out to like 880 millimeters. So they're pretty similar with your 1.6 times crop. But what we're really concerned about is the amount of detail that we get with these lenses cropped at the long end, because that's kind of what you end up doing with wildlife. But also the subject detection and the autofocus accuracy for really challenging things like flying birds. I'm a little nervous because this is not Panasonic's strong suit in the past, but I do want to try out the new tech and see how it does. I feel like I have a leg up because I have over 30 megapixels and you don't. Yeah, but I've got that micro four thirds small sensor. I, let's just see. Let's just see. Okay. 
Overall, subject detection works really well. It logs onto the subject and often even onto the bird's eye. The one thing I really don't like is the viewfinder's resolution is pretty low. So when I go to review my photos and zoom in, they're very pixelated and it can be difficult to tell if the shot is perfectly sharp. Chelsea complained about her electronic viewfinder, but it's much better in this one. I have 50% more pixels and yeah, things are pretty sharp. And this camera has animal detect, so it will see the bodies of birds or animals and draw a box. And that really helps you keep the subject in focus. The Canon, however, will actually focus on the head or the eye of the bird. And this one just kind of draws a general shape around it. Now, at a distance, that's not gonna matter, but the best shots you get are the ones where the animals are closest to you. And that means that the focusing accuracy won't be quite as good because it could connect to like the tip of the wing instead of the eye. I gotta say I'm a little frustrated because what would have been the best shot of the day was this osprey flew right at me, right over my head. And I was so close and it just missed focus on every shot. It just completely, even though I kept it in the frame, it drew a box around it, it couldn't get it in focus. Chelsea struggled with that too. But overall, I can't say this is better than the Canon or any of the Sony's, but it is better than the other Panasonic cameras I've had. And certainly in the micro four thirds world, this would be your best choice, I think. I did find the G9 II 60 frames per second really useful for wildlife. Like check out this egret. It just caught a little fish and it's going to toss it up and then catch it. But that moment happens so fast that you would completely miss it if your camera were even just 20 frames per second. Watch, here we go. There's one perfect frame here that's gonna be the best shot. There it is. And that's why ridiculously high frame rates are great for wildlife photographers. Wildlife photography can be an expensive hobby, but there's a way to get the most bang for your buck. And that's by shopping at our sponsor, Adorama. When you shop at Adorama, they'll often throw in some filters or a memory card or something else for free. Just make sure you look for the accessories kit option. You can also get VIP points, which you can redeem for future purchases. I just cashed in $200 worth of points on a purchase and I, I'm a practical person. I like to save money. So that's why I shop at Adorama. And whenever you're buying gear, please use our link here because that lets Adorama know that you heard about them through us and that helps unbiased reviews like this to keep coming. Thanks, Adorama. Now it's time to do a sports test and we both have the equivalent of 70 to 200 lenses. Mine's an F2.8. Yours is huge is what it is and your arms are gonna be tired by the time it's over. No, mine is big, but the thing is, I think we just need to compare the results because I think mine are gonna be cleaner and I'm gonna have more background blur, but you definitely have the size advantage. Okay, I, but let's talk about rolling shutter. Why? This gets complicated, but both of these cameras perform best in electronic shutter mode. When you use the electronic shutter, your camera does 30 frames per second. Incredible. Yeah. But my camera does 60 frames per second. It seems excessive. But when you use the electronic shutter, it introduces rolling shutter, which is the time it takes to read the entire sensor. And yours is about twice as bad. To objectively measure rolling shutter, I took a picture of this flickering light. And you can see with the G9 II, I got 12 lines of flicker. That's how many times the bulb flickered while the shutter was open. On the Canon, I got about 32, two and a half times more rolling shutter. A real problem on the Canon, but not so much on the Panasonic. And in the past, when we've tested the R7, that means things like a golf swing end up all warpy. Yeah, or straight lines in the background can end up tilty and distorted. So rolling shutter can be a problem if you're panning and you're shooting fast action. But my small sensor here, lower megapixels, but it reads out significantly faster. So those 60 frames per second could potentially produce better results, but we'll see if you actually notice. Yeah, I feel like specs are so complicated. Let's just take the pictures and see the difference. Okay. Tony, I'm gonna have you run, cause it's a nice toasty day. And <laughs> it's I, not nice, and it's you're extremely from hot. Texas, so you're- Oh man. I'm zooming all the way in at 200 millimeters. And then as he gets close, I'm zooming out a bit. Go. Here's the best run for each of the cameras. The black and white shots are counted as out of focus. The color shots are in focus. The Canon ran out of buffer at about 70 shots, even though we shot JPEG on both to reduce the buffering. The Canon got about 84% of the shots in focus. Pretty good, producing 59 sharp shots for each run on average. While the Canon got 84% in focus, the Loomis got only about 24% in focus, but it took a lot more shots, but that just meant there was more to sort through. It still got about 53 sharp shots through the run, but you can see almost all of them are at least a little bit out of focus. It was just falling behind me and it would like catch up and then fall back behind. 
so they clearly need to tweak their autofocus algorithm some more before we can use this for sports. There's another problem too. If you compare the Panasonic shots to the Canons, the Canons just looks nicer. The bokeh is bigger thanks to the bigger sensor and using the same f2.8 f-stop number. And if we zoom in on the details here, even though both these shots are counted as in focus, the Panasonic just lacks a lot of the detail. Like look at the detail in my eyebrows here, which is just completely lost on the Panasonic. Circling back to rolling shutter, you can see at this point in the run, I start to circle around Chelsea, so I'm moving sideways. And you can see on the Canon, I look a little bit tilty. You don't immediately know what it is, but it's a little weird. The Panasonic, I'm nice and straight, but on the Canon, I have nice big bokeh balls, and they're much less on the Panasonic, and also the Panasonic definitely just missed focus. And now for the video test, neither of these cameras are filmmaker cameras, but people do buy them and expect to be able to shoot stills and video, casual vlogs with the flip screen. And I want to make sure the Panasonic can keep people in focus because that hasn't been a strong suit in the past. So I'll hold up a subject to the camera in front of my face, kind of unboxing style, a common format for TikTok and YouTube. This happens to be the award-winning best-selling book with over a million readers, stunning digital photography. And if you don't like books, it's got 20 hours of video. And for some reason, the ebook is less than 10 bucks at Northrop.photo. Okay, I'm shocked. Even at 200 F56 equivalent, the G92 locked onto the book quickly and smoothly. The Canon R7, on the other hand, had significantly more lag. It took longer to lock focus onto the book, so much so that it was a little bit awkward. So the Panasonic shockingly beats Canon for the unboxing product video test. What the heck? Tracking moving subjects was a different story though. You can see as I'm moving in and out here, my eyes frequently go out of focus. The Panasonic can't quite keep up. Also look at the lights on the right side of the screen. They don't pull in and out of focus smoothly like they should be, instead sort of jerking. Uh, let's check out the Canon. The Canon, it's very smooth, and you could freeze any frame and my eyes would be locked in focus. Now this is an extreme example with extremely shallow depth of field. You probably won't see this with the standard kit lens. The Panasonic did well, and I think good enough, but the Canon won the moving video test. So overall, I think it's a draw. First, we wanna take a moment to thank our sponsor, Adorama. Whether you're interested in getting a camera, a lens, lights, a computer, a bag, anything you can imagine that has to do with photography, they have it, and they have great deals. They have a VIP points program, which Tony loves to use. So check out Adorama, and please use the links down below, because that lets them know these videos are worth sponsoring. We're sponsored by Adorama, but we've never accepted a sponsorship from Panasonic or Canon or any other camera manufacturer. And that's why we can just tell you frankly what works and what doesn't. Now we want to talk about some other possible competitors. Because people always say like, why'd you compare it to the R7? Why not some other camera? And they think we're like fixing the game. But let's talk about it. The X-H2 is a pretty similar camera. But in our testing of the Fujifilm X-H2, the autofocus hasn't been the best. And I was expecting this to sort of blow everything away. So I wanted to compare it to the best autofocusing system. Sony has the A6700, an APS-C camera that competes closely with the R7. But when we compared it to the R7, the R7 did better. Also, it doesn't have two card slots, so it's not really in the same class of camera. Canon has the full frame Canon R8 that is actually less expensive than this and full frame. And the R8 did great in our review. Great video, great stills camera, but it's not sports focused. Like it has a slow frames per second. And this struck me as a good sports and wildlife camera. So I wanted something that excelled in those areas. And that's why we arrived at the Canon R7. If you're a hybrid shooter, stills and video, the Panasonic is totally capable. So congrats. I think either way, this is a big win for Panasonic and Micro Four Thirds users. This is the camera to have, and it gives me hope for the future, especially maybe with a, for a couple of firmware updates, it might be time to recompare this. So subscribe to our channel because we have more reviews and tutorials coming up very soon. And check out Northrop.photo for photography education, incredibly low priced training for photography, Photoshop, Lightroom. Thank Bye. you.